Recently, I've been playing Hazelight's critically acclaimed platformer It Takes Two. Now, there's plenty of technical art wizardry on display in this game, but the thing that really caught my eye and got me thinking was this lava lamp. Not only does it look great, but it even has this effect where you can interact with it to change the shape of the lava bubbles, which doesn't make much sense, but it does look pretty cool. So how is it done? Well, I don't actually know, but I can tell you how I would solve this problem, which would be to use ray marching. Before we get started, there are a couple of concepts you should be familiar with. Number one is signed distance functions, or SDFs for short. Not to be confused with signed distance fields, also confusingly abbreviated to SDF. I have another video about those which you can find here. An SDF, in this case, is a function that, given a point in space, will tell you how far that point is from a surface. And for the purposes of this video, that surface will usually be a simple, primitive shape described by some elegant mathematical equation, such as a sphere or a box or a cone. It's the use of SDFs that makes ray marching so great for something like a lava lamp, as there are some neat functions we can use for blending primitives together into blobby, morphing forms like the lava in the lava lamp. Secondly, I want to clarify what I mean by ray. Here, a ray is just a point in space, and what makes it a ray is that we'll be moving that point around and stopping every now and then to call a distance function to find out how close that ray is to the surface of the scene. Now we've covered the basic idea, let's take a closer look at ray marching. Each ray will be sent into the scene from the camera, traveling along the view vector, so forwards. The ray will first stop immediately at the camera plane and ask our distance function how far it is from the surface of the scene. The ray will then march that distance forwards and ask again how far it is from the surface of the scene. It will repeat this process until the distance function returns such a small value that we can consider the ray to have hit something, or until the ray travels so far without hitting anything that we can call it a miss. This particular brand of ray marching that moves the ray the minimum safe distance after each step is also called sphere tracing. Let's implement what we know so far in Godot. First, we need an object to act as our canvas that will render our ray marched result onto. I like to use a cube for this as ray marching is quite expensive and having an object to render onto allows me to limit ray marching to a specific area of the scene. So let's create a cube, flip its faces, make it really big, add a new shader material and open the shader. Since we're in 3D, the shader type should be spatial and let's set the render mode to unshaded and disable the depth test as we'll need to handle shading and depth ourselves. Here we'll also define some important shader parameters. Max steps will define how many times we march a ray before considering it a miss. Max distance will define how far a ray can travel before it's considered a miss. And surface distance is how close a ray needs to be to a surface for it to be considered a hit. Next, in our fragment function, we need an origin and a direction for our ray. We'll get these like this. Here, we're just getting the world space position of the pixel and subtracting it from the camera position to get our ray direction. The camera position is, of course, also our ray origin. From here, we can start marching using a new function we'll call RayMarch. It'll take a ray origin and direction and will return the total distance traveled by the ray. First, we initialize the distance traveled as zero. Then we start our loop, which will continue as long as the number of iterations is less than the max steps we defined earlier. Within the loop, we get the current position of the ray, which is the origin plus the direction, multiplied by the total distance traveled. Next, we want to check how close the ray is to the scene. We'll encapsulate this distance check as its own function. And finally, we can add the distance result to our total distance traveled, moving the ray forwards. While we're here, we can also use the result of our distance check to see if our ray has hit something or traveled too far. So we'll add an if statement that checks if D is now greater than our max distance or if the distance to the scene is less than our surface distance. If either is true, we can break the loop and return the final total distance traveled. Otherwise, we let it keep on marching. Now let's tackle that distance function, as this is where we'll create the world we're actually trying to render. As you'd expect, our world is completely empty right now. So let's add a sphere to it using a sphere distance function, which looks like this. It takes the current position of our ray and the position and radius of a sphere and returns the distance between the ray and the surface of the sphere. 
We won't cover exactly how individual distance functions work in this video, but to learn more about those, check out the links in the description. So let's add a sphere to our world and give it any old position, since that's not important right now, and a radius of 1. Finally, we're ready to render. Back in our fragment function, we can call ray march using the ray origin and direction that we got earlier, and check if the ray ever hit anything using an if statement to see if the ray exceeded the max distance traveled. We can reduce this to a single step function to keep things tidy, but it does exactly the same thing. Taking a look at the result, our sphere is definitely there. But since we're only checking whether or not the ray hits something, we're seeing an unshaded circle. Let's remedy that by using this function that'll take our ray position and returns a normal. As you can see, it's quite a simple function that samples the distance to our scene at three additional points around the ray position, each shifted a small distance along the x, y, or z axis. Subtracting these distances from the original distance and normalizing the result gives us our surface normal. Let's not worry about using this for proper shading right now, and instead send the normal directly to the albedo output, so that we can see what's going on. Now that we can see what's going on in our raymarched world, let's add some more objects to it, and get it animating in the way we'd expect from a lava lamp. To do this, I've created three positions for our new shapes, using the built-in time multiplied by a new uniform called time scale, which we can use to speed up or slow down the animation. Then I get the sign of this scale time multiplied by some arbitrary floats to add variation to the movement of each shape along each axis. This should hopefully give the illusion of randomness to their movements and prevent them from moving in sync with one another. I've also added the abs function to the y-axis of our random positions to flip all negative values to positive ones, keeping our shapes at or above the origin, which will help with positioning everything inside the lava lamp later. Next, let's create four spheres, just as we did before but with a bit of cleanup. The sphere positions are now constructed from the shape positions we just created, multiplied by a new move scale variable, scaling how far our shapes will move along each axis. Since our lava lamp is many times taller than it is wide, we want to scale movement along the y-axis by quite a lot, and restrict movement along the x and z axes. The radius is then set using a new uniform called shape scale, and again this is scaled a bit differently per sphere for added variation. The fourth sphere has a fixed position and size, as this will provide the base of our lava which we don't want to move. Now that we have our spheres, we need to combine them into a single distance result for rendering, which means it's a perfect time to talk about Boolean operators. SDFs can be combined in a number of ways. They can be added together using a union operator. This takes two distances and very simply returns the lowest of the two. Or to put it another way, whichever is closest. There's also the subtract operator, which cuts one shape out of another by negating the first operand and then returning the max of the two distances. And finally, the intersection operator, again taking two distances and this time returning the maximum of the two, creating a new shape where both operands overlap. We'll take the union operator for our purposes and combine all spheres together, one after the other, until we have our final combined result. Now we're getting somewhere, but it doesn't look much like lava, because the intersections between our shapes are harsh, and not at all like the smooth blobby lava that we're aiming for. Fortunately, this is where the mathematical magic I mentioned earlier comes in. Inigo Kileth is more or less the authority on SDFs. Much of this video is based on his work. And if you check out his website, you'll find not only the simple Boolean functions we just covered, but also some rather more complex, smooth Boolean functions. These do exactly the same thing as their simple counterparts, but they have a new argument, k, which controls how smooth the result will be, blurring the boundaries between combined shapes. We won't cover exactly how these functions work in this video, because I actually don't really understand them myself, but if you want to dig into these, check out Inigo's website. The link is in the description. Swapping out our simple booleans for smooth ones now gives us a much better result. I've also added a new uniform to control the amount of smoothing called smoothness. Now that we have something a bit like our reference, I'll unhide this lava lamp model I made earlier and see what still needs to be done. We can move the lava into place using a new uniform I'll call position offset, and in our distance function we simply subtract that from the position of our ray to relocate the entire ray marched world upwards. Once in place we can immediately see a few issues. First, the result is very dark and obscured by the glass. I'll remedy this by scaling the albedo by a new uniform called brightness and scale it way up. Next there's the issue with the lava rendering in front of the lamp in places. 
This is due to the fact that our depth test was disabled, so there's no way for Godot to know whether our raymarsh results should be in front or behind opaque geometry. We can fix this in the shader by sampling the scene depth texture, which is done like this. Then there's this very hacky looking piece of code that turns the depth result into something more usable, which I just took directly from the Godot documentation, link is in the description. Now that we have the actual scene depth, we can add this to our step function that determines whether or not we hit something, replacing the max distance with the min of the max distance and the scene depth. This means that if the ray traveled further than the scene depth, we now also consider that to be a miss. And so any opaque geometry between the camera and our spheres will correctly block our view of the lava. The final issue is that the lava clips through the glass. I decided to fix this by adding a cone SDF to the shader and smoothly intersecting it with the spheres. I then positioned the cone using a couple of new uniforms and lined it up with the glass. The last thing to tackle is the color of the lava. Taking a look at some reference, I noticed two things. There seems to be a bottom to top light to dark gradient and a dark rim at glancing angles around the edge of the lava. This is fortunately quite straightforward to implement. For the height gradient, I got the final ray position as before and isolated the Y component. Then some simple math to offset, stretch and invert the gradient to achieve a good looking bottom to top white to black mask. Next, for the dark rim, we can get the dot product of the surface normal and the ray direction. Multiplying this with the height gradient then produces this result. Using this black and white mask to sample a gradient texture then gives us a lot of control over the final color of the lava. So it looks like we're done, but there's still one thing missing. In It Takes Two, you can change the shape of the lava bubbles. To add this functionality, I've added a new shape SDF for a rounded box and duplicated all of the code for the spheres, swapping the sphere distance function for the box distance function, along with a few small tweaks to keep the scale consistent between shapes. Then I blend between the two results using a new uniform called Shape Blend. And there we have the finished result. In hindsight, I think I strayed quite far from the original reference, but I ended up with something I'm happy with, and I also learned a thing or two along the way. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and check out the other videos on my channel. I also have a Patreon page where you can support me in my quest to create densely packed and aggressively edited videos about technical art and game development. The link is in the description. Supporting me will also get you access to all of my project files for this and all other videos. Sorry this one took so long, and thank you very much for watching.